Today's story is a skydiving disaster story. However, it does not go the way you think it will. And at the end of today's video, there is a very special call to action that is connected to the main story that I think many of you will be very excited to participate in, but no pressure. However, before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please sneak in to the like button's house and and swap out their cat for an identical looking cat. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. On the morning of August 1st, 2009, 44-year-old skydiving instructor David Hartsock pulled into the parking lot of Skydive Houston in Texas and then made his way inside. A few minutes later, and Dave, like the rest of his colleagues, was hard at work getting ready for the day before the facility opened up and the inevitable weekend rush began. Skydive Houston is actually just a private airport, and it's not really in Houston. It's located about 30 miles to the northwest of Houston in a city called Waller. The main facility of Skydive Houston is situated right up against this huge open airfield that basically looks like a big green grass field. And the main facility itself is comprised of several large buildings, one of which is a huge hangar that contains the Super Twin Otter airplanes, which are the little aircraft that bring the skydivers up so they can jump out. Because Skydive Houston offers something called tandem jumping, it gets a lot of first-time jumpers. Tandem jumping is when a skydiving student attaches to the front of their instructor, literally they're buckled onto them, and then the two of them leap out of the plane together with the student never detaching from the instructor. This method allows the student to just kind of go along for the ride and have no responsibility, while the instructor who's attached to them does everything. They make sure they're both stable in the air, they're the ones that pull the ripcord to deploy the chute, they're the ones that land them safely on the ground. And so obviously, tandem jumping really appeals to first-time jumpers. Dave had finished his three-year-long training course to become a certified skydiving instructor just a few months earlier, but even prior to going through this course, Dave was already a very experienced skydiver with over 800 jumps to his credit. And the reason he had so many jumps is because Dave loved skydiving. It had given his life a focus that really nothing else ever had. Dave had always been a kind of average guy. He lived in a very modest house in a suburb of Houston, and for much of his life, he had worked very normal blue-collar jobs, like he had been a cook at two different chain restaurants, he had managed a grocery store, and he also had worked at a soda bottling plant. Dave was divorced and had no kids, but he had a really good group of friends who liked to go to bars and go bowling and play darts. And while Dave was never really unhappy with the way his life was going, as he started to creep into his 40s, he couldn't help but think, you know, I haven't really done anything big or important in my life. And so in 2004, not long after Dave got divorced, one of his good friends asked him if he wanted to go skydiving with him to celebrate that friend's 40th birthday. And Dave immediately thought to himself, this is it. This is a chance to do something big with my life. And so he told the friend, yes, I'd love to go. And after that first jump that Dave did with his friend, Dave was hooked. Whenever Dave was falling through the sky at over 100 miles per hour, it was like nothing else in the whole world even existed. Life became very simple and beautiful. The manager at Skydive Houston saw Dave come in every weekend for years to do all these jumps, and finally, he just offered Dave a job. And so that was how Dave left the soda bottling plant to become a skydiving instructor. So, August 1st, 2009 was a Saturday, and Saturdays at Skydive Houston were incredibly busy with basically non-stop tandem jumps all day. Whenever Dave was not working, so he was jumping on his own, he would always pack his own parachute because, like many other skydivers, he liked to make sure it was done exactly right. 
But when Dave was working, especially on Saturdays when it was so crazy busy, he didn't have time to pack and repack his parachute after every single jump because he was constantly being sent up again and again and again to take another student. And so instead, he would take one of the pre-packed parachutes that were left out for instructors inside of their clubhouse. That particular Saturday in August of 2009 went very quickly, with Dave going up one after another with different students and jumping out and pulling the chute and landing safely over and over again. And then finally, at the end of the day, right around four o'clock, when Dave was getting ready to be done for the day, his manager came up to him and said, hey, do you mind doing one more tandem jump? And even though Dave was really exhausted, he's dripping sweat, it's super hot outside, he'd done six jumps that day, which was a lot, he said, no problem. Well, it's that time of the year again, which means the big game is right around the corner. Right now, trillions of people are rushing to their local owlries to get their mitts on the perfect winged beast for their game day buffalo owl dip. Meanwhile, me and old Long focus on what really counts on game day, and that's finger strength. Every day for the past 20 decades, me and Lungy have been waking up at 1 a.m. every day and putting our fingers through a grueling powerlifting routine so that on game day, when we fire up our gasoline-powered cell phones and load up our DraftKings Sportsbook app, as soon as we see the bets we like, our fingers are so jacked that when we tap on our screens, our fingers go through the phone. Now, does that ruin the phone? Yes. Is it worth it? I don't know, but it jacks us up. We're so <laughs> now, does that ruin the phone? Yes. <laughs> now, does that ruin the phone? Yes. But is it worth it? Probably not, but it gets me and old Lungy jacked up on game day. So, if you want to be a betting behemoth like me and old Lung, then you better put that hooter back in the owlry and head to your local gym and start pumping some finger iron. Because this year, I'm teaming up with DraftKings to give all new customers a winning offer. All new customers have to do is sign up for DraftKings using my promo code, Mr. Ballin, and then bet at least $5 on the big game and you will instantly receive an additional $200 in bonus bets. Yes, it really is that simple. New customers who bet $5 on the big game will get $200 extra in bonus bets. Wondering what you could use that $200 in bonus bets on? You could try same game parlays, where you combine multiple bets from one game, like which team will have the most passing yards and which team will have the first touchdown of the night for even bigger winnings. If mobile sports betting is not yet available in your state, don't worry, you can still get in on the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use promo code MrBallin and bet $5 on the big game and get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Again, that's promo code MrBallin only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Okay, back to the story. And so the manager introduced Dave to a short blonde woman who was visibly nervous named Shirley Diggert, who was there to celebrate her 54th birthday by skydiving for the first time. Her husband, her son, and her three grandkids were also there to watch her from the ground and take pictures. And her other son, who was celebrating his 30th birthday, he too was going skydiving. As soon as Dave walked up to Shirley, he grinned and stuck out his hand, and he made the same kind of corny joke he always made with nervous first-time jumpers, and that was, don't worry, you're gonna be just fine, you're gonna be strapped to me, and I'm not about to let anything happen to myself. And so Shirley laughed, and she did seem like she was a little bit at ease, and so Dave patted her on the shoulder, and then he walked over and he grabbed one of the pre-packed parachutes off the wall. These chutes actually contained two parachutes inside of the backpack. There was the main chute, which typically is the only chute that gets deployed on a jump, and then there was the reserve chute, which is a little bit smaller and is not normally used unless there's some sort of emergency where the main chute fails. 
after every jump, because the main chute has been deployed, it gets repacked and stuffed back into the backpack. But the reserve chute, because it almost never gets deployed, just stays packed. And so Skydive Houston, like basically every other skydiving facility, has certified technicians come in periodically to test the reserve chutes inside of the bag to make sure they're still packed exactly right. After grabbing the pre-packed parachute off the wall, Dave walked back over to Shirley, who was now in the staging area, putting on her flight suit. A flight suit is a single garment. It kind of looks like a big onesie for an adult. And so Dave walked over, he put the parachute down, he tugged and pulled on her flight suit to make sure it was good. And then after he was satisfied, he picked the parachute back up and he signaled to Shirley, as well as Shirley's son, who was also skydiving, to follow him. And so the trio, they left the staging area, they went outside right to the airfield where there was a super twin otter idling and other jumpers were climbing on board to go for a jump. And so Dave, Shirley, and Shirley's son got in line, they boarded the plane, and a few minutes later, they were airborne. As the plane slowly climbed up to 13,500 feet, which is the jumping altitude, Shirley was sitting directly in front of Dave. They were on a bench seat on the back right of this little airplane. And Dave made a point of talking to Shirley and asking her where she was from and what she did to kind of ease her nerves. Shirley would tell Dave that this was not the kind of thing that she typically did. In fact, she told Dave that her other son who was jumping with them, when he first decided he wanted to try skydiving a year earlier, she had desperately tried to talk him out of it, saying it was too dangerous. But recently, Shirley and her husband had decided that they needed to be more adventurous. They lived in a quiet town in rural Texas where Shirley was a male carrier and her husband worked in a mine and their lives were just kind of simple and very routine oriented and kind of boring. So when Shirley's son, who was skydiving with them that day, had asked Shirley to go skydiving on her 54th birthday, she saw it as an opportunity to break the mold and do something adventurous. And so she said yes. And so Dave told Shirley about how he had discovered skydiving much the same way she had. And they really bonded over that. About 20 minutes after takeoff, all the tandem jumpers on the plane were now attached to their instructors. So Shirley was now buckled onto Dave. And then when they reached 13,500 feet, the jumping altitude, one of the instructors slid open the side door. It was time to jump. And the first one who was jumping was Shirley's son. And so from all the way back in the plane, Shirley called out to her son, have a good jump, I'll see you on the ground. As her son kind of waddled to the edge of the door with his instructor and the two of them jumped out and disappeared into the air below. Next up was Shirley. So Dave told Shirley very calmly to stand up. And so they did, they stood up right next to their bench. And then before they waddled towards the exit, Dave, for what felt like the millionth time, checked to make sure he really was securely fastened onto Shirley. And then Dave tapped his ripcord right behind him, kind of like muscle memory, reminding himself where to go. He tapped his knife on his shoulder. He kind of just felt his equipment and then feeling ready, he said, okay, Shirley, let's go. And then the two of them kind of waddled their way towards the front of the plane where that door was slid wide open and then they turned so Shirley's feet were right on the edge basically looking out into the sky right outside and so it's really loud it's very windy and Dave is right in Shirley's ear saying okay I'm gonna count to three and we're gonna jump and then Dave reached forward he pulled Shirley's head back so she was looking up because he didn't want her to look down when they leapt out because for some people that will cause them to panic when they see the ground and so with Shirley's head back Dave very calmly said one two three and then very gracefully the two of them jumped out. From the moment you jump out of a plane at 13,500 feet until you touch the ground, it takes maybe two to three minutes with about 30 seconds to a minute of actual free fall. But that two to three minutes is so intense, it feels like it's 20 minutes long. And this was what Dave loved so much about skydiving, that intense presence you feel, that you're really in the moment. There's nothing else you can think about. It's just you careening through the sky towards the earth. It's incredible. Dave had actually had a number of close calls in his life. Like a few years earlier, he had been riding his motorcycle when somebody hit him in their car and he fractured his skull. And then not long after that accident, he was in another accident where he fractured his spine. And after each of those two accidents and a few others, the only thought in Dave's mind was, oh my goodness, I hope I can skydive again. And miraculously, he had been. He had made full recoveries and he was back to skydiving each time. And so now, whenever he jumped out of a plane, he just felt so lucky. 
The plan for that evening's jump was for Dave to rotate them 360 degrees three separate times so Shirley could get a full look down across Houston and all over Texas and just kind of see the world around her from so high up in the air. And then whenever Dave noticed that they were at 5,000 feet using his wrist altimeter, which is basically like a watch that tells you how far you are from the ground, Dave would pull the ripcord, the main chute would deploy, and they would float gently down to the ground. And at first, that is how this jump went. After they exited the plane, they stabilized in the proper horizontal position with Shirley in front, her stomach pointing toward the ground, and Dave obviously right behind her, controlling the skydive. And then after a few seconds, Dave slightly changed his body position and began rotating them 360 degrees so Shirley could look down and see all the highways and cars and barns and houses and the city off in the distance. I mean, it's this spectacular view. and. And as you're falling through the sky, especially in the first few seconds of a jump, you can't tell that you're going super fast, but you're going over 120 miles an hour, which is called terminal velocity. It's literally the fastest you can fall in the air. And so you're blazing towards the ground, but it almost feels like the air is pushing you back up. And so Shirley's having this incredible first time experience, just really taking it all in. And Dave, even though he had done this hundreds of times, was having a wonderful time as well, but Dave really was just focused on his altimeter because when they hit 5,000 feet, he needed to pull the parachute. And so they're cruising along, Dave's checking his altimeter over and over again. And then finally he sees 5,000 feet. He quickly looks around him to scan for any other jumpers. He's clear. And so he reached back and he pulled his ripcord handle for his main chute. Now, normally when you deploy your main parachute, depending on what kind of parachute you're using, there's actually kind of a slow unfurling. It's not like suddenly the chute is deployed and then you just stop. That would not work. You'd get destroyed every time you skydive. So the way it's packed is it kind of unfurls slowly and it's like a gradual slowing down. But after Dave has pulled the ripcord handle, there was an immediate yank of the parachute backpack up and away from him. And then from somewhere above him, he heard a loud popping sound. Now, Dave had jumped enough times to know that this was not normal. There was a problem and he would be right. The main parachute had deployed out of the backpack, but it got tangled on the way out. And so it did not inflate at all. And so as a result, it was not slowing them down at all. But worse than that was this tangled up parachute was still attached to them and it kind of became like a sail. And it turned Dave and Shirley onto their sides and began whipping them around in something called a death spiral, where literally you're just spinning so unbelievably fast that normally jumpers will actually lose consciousness. They're spinning so fast. But Dave, being a very experienced skydiver, he tried to stay calm. He tried to track his way out of this death spiral, which is when you put your arms and legs straight and try to go in a straight line through the air, but it didn't work. He just kept on spinning faster and faster. And at this point, Shirley, she's practically losing consciousness. She's yelling what's going on. And Dave is just trying to stay calm. He's still trying to get out of it, but he knows there's no way. But Dave remembers he has two knives. And so he decides he's gonna cut away this tangled main chute and then deploy his reserve chute because you don't wanna open your reserve directly into a tangled parachute. And so he reaches up, he's spinning, remember, he reaches up and he grabs the first knife. However, the lines of the tangled parachute had actually tangled on his shoulder strap where that first knife was. And so he literally couldn't get to the knife. And so now they're below 5,000 feet. They're at like 4,000 closing in on 3,000 feet. I mean, they're coming close to the ground here and they don't have a canopy. But Dave, he stays calm. They're spinning around. He can't get that first knife. And so he reaches for the second knife, which was placed in front of Shirley. But because of how quickly they were spinning, he couldn't quite get his arm out to grab the second knife. It was just impossible to grab it. And so without any other options, Dave had to pull his reserve chute, knowing it was going to go straight into this tangled mess right above them. And so the reserve chute, it deploys and it does work, at least at first. There's that gradual slowing down sensation that Dave immediately feels. Their spin begins to stop. And for a second, it seems like they're going to be saved by this reserve chute. Because by now, they're only about 2,000 feet from the ground. 
However, the worst case scenario happens to Dave and Shirley. As soon as their reserve chute was up over their head, inflated, their main chute suddenly caught air and inflated as well. So they had two parachutes. Now, you can land with two parachutes, absolutely. However, sometimes in a worst case scenario, the two parachutes will catch wind going in opposite directions. So basically the parachutes will go out to either side of the jumper or jumpers if it's tandem. And then you basically have wings that aim the jumpers straight at the ground. It's like an accelerant. It causes them to literally speed up straight towards the ground. And once you start moving in this position, which is known as a down plane, it's almost impossible to get out of it because the fast you go, the more inflated these two parachutes become. And so Dave knows they are less than 2,000 feet from the ground, they're in a down plane, which is almost always fatal, and so all he can do is try to get out of the down plane. And so Dave, with all his might, he begins yanking on the different lines of both parachutes, and he manages to get them out of the down plane, which is nearly impossible to do. He does it. And then both parachutes collapse. And suddenly, Dave and Shirley have no parachute, they're less than a thousand feet from the ground, and they are falling once again over 100 miles per hour straight down to the earth. Now, at this moment, Shirley is crying, she's screaming, she doesn't know what's going on, and Dave has this incredible sense of calm come over him. Years ago, Dave had given up on the idea of ever having a family or of having kids. He was a really good guy who would have been a great father, but it just wasn't in the cards for him. Instead, Dave had found skydiving. Oftentimes, Dave would stay late at Skydive Houston and just sit around the campfire with the other instructors and the other jumpers and drink beers and eat burgers and tell stories. And sometimes Dave would even sleep the night at Skydive Houston because he didn't want to go back home to his empty three bedroom house where all he wanted to do when he was there was go skydiving again. But now, literally staring down his own death, knowing that it's gonna happen any second, the only thing he could think about was Shirley. He didn't care if he died. He felt like he had found his calling. If he died doing it, so be it. But Shirley, her husband, her son on the ground, her son skydiving, her three grandkids, they're gonna see Shirley hit the ground and die. He just couldn't handle it. He thought, I have to do something to protect Shirley. And with only a few hundred feet to the ground, Dave yelled to Shirley, tuck your knees up. And Shirley immediately did it. She threw her knees up. And as she did, Dave pulled back as hard as he possibly could on the risers and the toggles in an attempt to switch places with Shirley. Shirley was in front of him. Her body's gonna hit the ground first. Dave flipped them around so that his back was gonna hit the ground first. He was going to sacrifice himself to maybe save Shirley. When they hit the ground, people a quarter mile away heard their impact. And when they hit the ground, all of Shirley's family saw it. Everybody saw it. They went running over to the crash site. And when they got there, there was this tangle of bodies and this parachute. And as they're staring at it, they watched one of the bodies move. It was Shirley. She was alive. After paramedics arrived, they cut her off of Dave's body and they rushed her to the hospital where she had serious injuries. She had several broken vertebrae and very significant internal injuries, but none of them were life-threatening. She would survive. However, three days after arriving in the hospital, Shirley got devastating news. Dave had been rushed to the hospital as well right after Shirley had, but he finally had succumbed to his injuries and passed away. Dave's last ditch maneuver had worked. He had saved Shirley's life at the cost of his own. However, not long after Shirley and her family found out about Dave's death, they got another call, and this time it was to tell them that the news about Dave's death was premature. He was not dead. However, he was paralyzed from the neck down. A few weeks later, after Shirley got out of the hospital, she immediately went to the intensive care unit where Dave was being treated to see him for the first time since their accident. And when she saw him, he was sitting in a wheelchair covered in tubes and wires, and she just stood there looking at him. And Dave, when he saw Shirley, he just started to cry. At this point, Shirley walked up to him, she gave him a hug, and she said, I love you. Today, Dave and Shirley are still friends. 
Shirley has recovered completely because of Dave's heroic act. Dave, on the other hand, remains paralyzed and only has a little bit of feeling in his right arm. He now lives in Texas with his mother, who looks after him full time, and they desperately need our support. My family has already made a donation to his GoFundMe page, and I hope some of you will do the same thing. You can find his GoFundMe page in the description below. And after speaking with him, he assured me that all of the donation money is being used to take care of himself. He has a lot of care that he needs. His mom can't do it alone. And so anything we give them is just making his life a little bit easier. I always tell my oldest daughter to do things that scare her because oftentimes those are the things we actually want to do the most. And so today I'm going to live up to what I always tell my kid to do because today I'm announcing my first ever live storytelling show. Doing a live event has always been so interesting to me, but it's actually just kind of terrified me. And so I got to do it. It's going to be a digital live experience on February 16th, so roughly two weeks from now. And because it's so close to Valentine's Day, we decided to call this show the Valentine's Day Show. And this one hour long show will just be me at my desk with no script, telling you crazy, strange, dark, and mysterious stories in real time. If this first show goes really well and people enjoy it and they want more of it, then I think there's a real chance we transition to a full-scale tour where maybe I could be telling live stories in campgrounds or in locations where some of these stories have taken place. We don't know yet, but it all starts with this first show. So to show your support and to tell us that you want a live tour, go get your tickets now. There's even some really cool special limited edition Valentine's Day merch that you can get as part of a ticket bundle. Also, I'll be doing a live Q&A after the show that you can get a pass to as well. Go to moment.co slash Mr. Ballin to get your tickets, to get your merch, to get your after party passes. Again, that's moment.co slash Mr. Ballin. Happy Valentine's Day. So that's gonna do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please sneak into the like button's house and replace their cat with an identical looking cat. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. We now have a podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast that puts out brand new podcast exclusive stories on Monday mornings. And on Thursday mornings, we put up the remastered audio of our best YouTube videos. Again, it's called the Mr. Ballin Podcast and it's available exclusively on Amazon Music. We have two additional YouTube channels. One is called Mr. Ballin Shorts. The other is called Mr. Ballin and Espanol. We post near daily content on TikTok, Facebook, and Snapchat. All of those pages are just called Mr. Ballin. If you wanna get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Check out our merch at shopmrballin.com and if you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, other YouTube channels, the podcast, wherever, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.